The lores of magic play a pivotal role in both Toy War Warhammer and the tabletop for all the many editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Um, but we've come to experience a lot of different lores for race. You know, we've talked about the high magic of the high elves, the dark magic of the dark elves, um, the lore of Nehekara when it comes to the Tomb Kings, and all the many variances of the many lores or winds of magic. But one lore of magic that we haven't talked about, and, and something that has really kind of fallen to the wayside, this is only a lore of magic in the 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy Battles. And in my opinion, the 6th edition Wood Elf book is by far the best version of the Wood Elf army books. Uh, you've got the Kindreds, you've got the Spites, you've got the, the, all the lore, the, the lore of Athaloran. You've got so much character in this book that really gets stripped down and homogenized come the 8th edition uh, Warhammer army book. So what I'd like to do in this video today is go through the lore of Athel Lauren. Uh, this is a, a lore that I proposed as a hopeful speculative lore added with uh, some sort of Wood Elf rework. Um, in the 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy, uh, we saw the lore of Dark and the lore of High Magic both coming to the Wood Elves with their own respective lore attributes. Uh, they lost the lore of Athel Lauren and instead gained access to uh, High and Dark Magic, which not it's not terrible it's actually quite cool and it's very it's very thematic because it's it's trying to say that the wood elves strike that direct balance between the high and the dark so they can tap into both which i, I found was actually very thematic again and very cool now what i'm going to do here is uh, i've decided to rather than just scroll through the lore of magic i'm going to just use this pdf to talk about things it's just way easier and i think a little bit more interactive um what i'm going to do is talk about first this whole little blurb here on the lore of uh athel Lauren. And then we'll go through each one of the spells and how I think they could, they could be translated to a Total War environment. Because the lore of Athel Lauren borrows from a bunch of different lores. And you're going to hear that in the lore blurb we, we jump into here. So let's start here with the Fey Magic of the Wood Elves. The elves are able to manipulate the winds of magic with a grace, ease, and flair unmatched by any of the younger, cruder races. Wood Elves are no exception, and there are many skilled practitioners of their own particular phase strand of magic within the bounds of Athel Lauren. Wood Elf mages tend to follow the path of the ancient elven god of renewal and rebirth, Aisha, and are sometimes known as the Handmaidens or Stewards of Ariel. Skilled in the arts of spellweaving, they are able to manipulate the energies of Athel Lauren in many varied ways. They are adept at creating powerful illusions and glamours, as well as being masters in the mystical arts of healing and regrowth. They are capable of weaving spells of confusion and trickery that can ensure that an intruder will be unable to discover an elven hall, even if he walks only feet from its majestic doors. They can cast dangerous blasts that strip trespassers of their wits and memories, and heal grievous wounds with but the touch of a hand. They are capable of encouraging trees and undergrowth to, to spontaneous growth, which can then be directed to create elegant and artful forms. In this manner, the elves can create beautiful artistry, such as delicately twisting pillars of living branches that form the basis of a graceful monuments and structures. Trees and foliage can be encouraged by skillful wood elf mages to uproot and move about, blocking off paths and creating new glades. This is often used as a subtle warning, and most will be so unnerved by this that they leave Athel Lauren immediately. But those that choose to ignore such warnings are dealt with without mercy. Other Wood Elf mages specialize in learning the secret magical paths of Athel Lauren, enabling them to disappear like smoke, only to reappear in a completely different location. Wood Elf mages are capable of all manner of fey sorceries, and our artful, spell and artful spells are rightfully feared by all. So you get this kind of sense for this this lore of magic being something that is um, got some illusory qualities attached to it, some healing qualities, some destructive qualities, but also um, qualities that dip deep into the kind of um, I guess you could say nether of the of nature that you would come to expect from a lore attached to well the wood elves. So. Here we have the lore of Athalorn itself. Now, in the 6th edition, you didn't have lore attributes. Lore attributes were attributed in, I believe, the 7th edition is when it started. I'll ask Lore Master of Sotek. Um, and the reason I ask him is because I wasn't present for 7th edition. I played 
uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, didn't play seventh, and then I started eighth. And eighth is when they added, well, that's eighth is when I saw lore attributes. So I'll confirm with him to make sure. Um, but either way, Lord of Athaloran doesn't have a lore attribute. But what I think would be cool here for a lore attribute for Athaloran would be kind of something akin to what we get with high magic. High magic gives us a ward save, um, and it's the same thing that it did in tabletop. But what I think would be cool here for the lore of Athaloran. Um, typically those lore attributes kind of shore up something with the army itself, right? Um, uh, the, the ward save helps kind of, or I'm sorry, the high magic ward save really plays into the martial prowess and staying above 50% health, adding to that tankiness, right? Uh, when you look at the lore of Nehekara, it helps to rejuvenate and resurrect the undead, and, and it plays very heavily into the, uh, the under, underarching lore of the Tomb Kings. So what if Athaloran provided a bonus to armor, um, shoring up some of the gaps in the, the Wood Elf kind of, I guess you could say, kink in their armor, which is their low armor. A lot of their units do have quite low armor, unless you're looking at stuff like Treekin or Treemen, which have, you know, 80 armor. I think a, a Treemen has like 110 or 100 off the top of my head. But adding armor to them, kind of um, symbolizing that, that as you use these spells, the woods themselves kind of converge to help out the um the wood elves in some way or shape or form and maybe it's not uh, armor maybe it's melee defense because melee defense is more indicative of the ability to dodge attacks parry attacks uh, get out of the way of an attack some way or another and maybe these spells kind of we like as far as like a role play mechanic goes I mean, obviously this wouldn't happen in the game <laughs> but like weaves uh, brambles and branches through things so that wood elves can twist around and attack things better just to kind of create a head cannon for how that lore attribute would work um, but also from a mechanical standpoint adding melee defense or armor to a wood elf army would be very advantageous because those are some of their weaker points now, let's take a look at their spells. Now, their spells are, are quite different, and they kind of come from a time when the spells of Warhammer Fantasy were a little bit more uh, nebulous. Um, in 8th edition, they became very hyper-focused. You either had hex spells, direct damage spells, um, vortex spells, uh, boons, more or less is what they were called. Um, they were called boons. They were called... Um oh, the opposite of hex. I can't think off the top of my head. But you, you were had... Each spell was classified. In 6th edition, again, it was a little bit more like, let's just put some fucking shit in a book and see how it goes. Yay! So with the first spell here, Tree Singing, you get something that is going to have to be an interesting one-to-one -one transfer when it comes to Total War Warhammer. Mage encourages the spirits of Athaloran to make the forests shift and begin moving. And essentially how this works here is you choose any wood, like a, like a, like a forest or wood area on the map within 18 inches of the caster, and then that wood moves. Which is kind of cool, right? You know, you're, you're singing to the woods, it's going to get up and go, oh, you know, let's start doing a little jig, let's do a little dance. The way I kind of see tree singing envisioned, rather than doing that, I just think of this as a summon ability for dryads. Uh, maybe overcasted to summon up tree kin, which might be too strong, but I think it'd be interesting if um, this is just simply, okay, well, now the spell the spell weaver can summon up a unit of dryads and they can attack. And, and it makes dryads a little bit more um, useful, I guess I could say. When I think of very competitive lists, dryads usually shore up a little bit of uh, gaps or at least portions of your point cost. You're like, oh, okay, well, I'll just... I'll just kind of put some dryads here. And when I think of playing campaign, I almost never use dryads because unless you can really buff them up through, say, I believe Durthu's got some impressive skills for, for buffing them, or even actually Alariel can make dryads pretty beastly, um, I just don't use dryads. And I think tree singing is a cool way to get dryads in the game without me having to deal with the upkeep and the, the cost of recruiting them. So this is a, an interesting way, I think, of getting uh, um, some kind of backline harassment and some fast attack moving things or, or ways to get into a backline that I think that outside of Hawk Riders and Wild Riders, the Wood Elves kind of lack. So I think that'll be a kind of an interesting spell here. Now, the next spell here, Fury of the Forest, is is pretty straightforward. Uh, twisted branches and thorns burst into spontaneous growth, attacking the enemies of Athaloran. Now, this plays to me, in my mind, uh, very similar to, um, you know, Awakening the Wood or the lore of life spells that are just basically the trees burst up and smash apart things. And I think that th that, that could really be the same way. And what I've really enjoyed about reading through the, Ath the lore of Athaloran is a lot of these spells have, if successfully cast, the spell causes D6 strength 4 hits. 
if the target is within six inches of a wood, then it is increased to D6 strength five hits. I would like to see stuff like that be pretty prevalent throughout the lore of Atholoran if it were to make it into Total War Warhammer. Uh, when you already play as the Wood Elves and you choose a Branch Wraith or any character that you're looking to get the benefit of your Winds of Magic Reserves replenishing quickly in Woods, it, it makes playing the Wood Elves fun. And that was a big portion of playing the Wood Elves in 8th edition, 7th edition, 6th edition, was, okay, where do, where's the woods? Because I need to find the woods because my characters can shoot through woods, they can ignore terrain, and they can um, deal with, they get benefits for firing out of or within woods. You don't get that as much from the Wood Elves in Total War Warhammer. There are some abilities, obviously, like Forest Strider or Branch Wraith's uh, Rejuvenating uh, uh, Winds of Magic. But I think a lore of magic that gets additional benefits being casted on near or within woods would be very fun and cool and thematic. And it would make looking at the map um, as you choose wood elves in a competitive situation or even in the campaign, making sure you fight on wooded areas. It would it would just kind of create that narrative that, okay, I'm the wood elves. I want to fight on, in the woods here to get the most benefit out of my spells. Um, the hidden path here is an interesting one. Basically, you or let me read the lore blurb. Using this spell, the caster moves a single friendly... Oops, I thought that was... Oh no, a single friendly unit out of a corporeal world and beyond the reach of mortals. I thought that was the actual rules of it. In 6th edition, they didn't have a lore blurb like all the 8th edition ones do. But hidden path is just simply um, a movement spell, uh, much like a walk between worlds for high magic, which did not make it into Total War Warhammer. So here's how I envision this spell. We see a lot of spells that actually reduce movement speed and do damage. Well, I think Hidden Path should be opposite. It should increase the movement speed of a unit, let's just say, I'm going to say 22% or, or 12%. I'm not sure what would break things, but 12%, 22%, but also give it an increased defense towards ranged attack. Because as you can see here, um, if the spell is successful, the unit treats all terrain as open ground and cannot be harmed by non-magic missile weapons until the start of the caster's next magic phase. So it'd be really cool to see this give you an increased movement, which is unlike any spell for the most part in Total War. I mean, there are lore attributes like Lore of Beasts and some spells here and there that help out with that, but it's for the most part not as prevalent as a snaring effect and give you a bonus to either Missile Parry or, or Missile Resistance. I think that'd be a very interesting way to deal with um, stuff like Wild Riders, of, or Wild Riders, which if they're not with shields, they can get pretty plucked apart, or Hawk Riders, um, stuff like that, where you can kind of shore up some of those uh, uh, range defense gaps. Twilight Host here is another interesting spell. Uh, the mage weaves a powerful illusion and ghostly gray shapes appear at the side of the Wood Elves. Um, so, the way that this works is uh, it just simply instills fear and or terror onto the uh, unit you choose to give it to. Um, so you can say, okay, my Eternal Guard now cause fear, or if they already cause fear, they now cause terror. So I just simply look at this as doom and darkness. I think it should just be a, a simple one-to-one -one conversion. Let's not get crazy with this spell. It could just simply be borrowing from that toolkit of death. Quick and easy. Now, Ariel's Blessing is, a, again, another quick one-to-one, -one, a very quick, easy one. So the caster calls upon the healing powers of Ariel, undoing even the most grievous injuries and restoring life to those who have fallen. And again, let's just borrow from the lore of life. Let's, if you want to make this, um, if you'll notice here, it's, it's a little bit more prevalent in some of the later editions, but the latter three spells usually have a higher casting value than the former three spells. We get the same thing when we take a look at Total War Warhammer. Usually they have a little blue gem if they're the latter three, and they cost more if you're looking at a competitive standpoint, like in the multiplayer. And they're also barred in campaign skill lines by the that middle skill. Um, the former three are usually the entry, and they're a little bit cheaper. So if we want to make Ariel's Blessing the, the latter three, then I think it should just be a regrowth. If we want to make it the former three, make it an earth blood. So you've got a lot of functionality with this. Tree singing might be a little too strong to have as a, as a tier one quote unquote spell. So make it a tier two spell, swap Ariel's blessing over here. And then you've got a summon in your blue area in your tier two, and you've got a heal in your tier one, making it very great for early campaign. Um, really good for just kind of putting onto a lot of your spell weavers and in a competitive sense. So Ariel's blessing, I think quick one-to-one -one regrowth or earth blood, depending on the situation. Um, now, the last one here is kind of interesting. So we'll, we'll, we will read this together. 
The Call of the Hunt. The spirit of Kurnos fills the target of the spell, infusing them with a part of his savagery, anger, and power. This spell may be cast upon a single friendly unit within 18 inches and may be targeted on a unit engaged in close combat. If already engaged in combat, each model in the unit gains one attack. If the unit is not engaged in combat, it immediately makes a 2d6 inch move towards the nearest enemy unit that it can see. If it can see no enemy unit, then it will move straight forward. The unit that moves in such a way cannot shoot that turn. If this move brings a unit into contact with the enemy, it counts as charging an enemy, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't even need to worry about that part. So, essentially, for all intents and purposes, it gives you an increase to your attack, and it, it helps you move. So, I think that, uh, the way I had kind of looked at this, you could kind of make it like the hidden path, where you get an increase to move, and then it just simply increases your melee attack. What I think would be kind of a little bit more thematic would be, you know, you think Call of the Hunt, you think the Wild Riders of Kurnos, you think of their talismanic um, tattoos, the tribal tattoos. Um, they're, they're not bros from Simi Valley. Um, so the Call of the Hunt here and the, the, the Riders of Kurnos talismanic tattoos, I would think of an increase to melee attack, an increase to weapon strength, and a slight physical resistance buff. That's how I would think the envisioning, or that's my envisioning, all of the call of the hunt. Of uh, you're, you're taking, you know, you're sounding the horn. The spirit of Kurnos is going to fill these individuals, and typically those talismanic tattoos come into place when you think of Kurnos and those uh, wild riders, or when you think of um, any of the dancers. Uh, that that Kurnos kind of talismanic tattoos comes to mind. So I would think that a fun way to do this would just be trade increase to melee attack, a trade increase to their. Um, a weapon strength, and then a buff to like, uh, like 10, 15, or 20% physical resistance. Uh, and having the ability to either single cast it on a unit or overcast it in an area around. Um, you could just do sim simply overcast as an extended duration, but I like the kind of idea that you can really imbue all of your characters or all of your units with a lot of uh, uh, punching power by overcasting this and costing you a lot of wins of magic, but you're going to really maybe swing the battle in a pretty hard way. But for the most part, that kind of shores up our lore of Athel Lauren. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys think about this lore. Do you think that the Wood Elves need their own specific lore? Uh, they did have it in tabletop, and it did evolve into getting access to the lore of Dark and the lore of High with their own lore attributes. Uh, even if you think that needs to happen, let me know below. I I'd love to hear what your opinions are. Also, if you think that this is maybe too passive of a lore and it deals a little too much with buffing and debuffing, let me know. Maybe maybe we need to swap something out here for, I don't know, a, a direct damage spell, uh, which you kind of get with Fury of the Forest, right? Fury of the Forest is kind of similar to that. You're getting just straight up damage in the same way that you get from Awakening Wood. Um, but maybe you need something like a wind ability that is the, the opposite of, not necessarily the opposite of Chill Wind, but very similar to Chill Wind, where it does direct damage as these brambles shoot up from the ground and it slows things down as it kind of gets ensnared by the roots. Maybe we need something like that that kind of borrows from the lore of dark. So it is this kind of combination of the lore of dark, the lore of light, the lore of high magic, something like that. Let me know in the comment section below because I'd love to hear how you guys think this should be kind of translated into Total War Warhammer. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.